This episode of the Musicians Map podcast is sponsored by Piano Picnic. If you've ever thought about learning keyboard or piano and you're looking up lessons online and you think that they look really boring and they're classically oriented and you're not a fan of classical music or you just can't get to a teacher in person uh, or lessons are too expensive, pianopicnic.com makes it super easy to learn piano for beginners and for intermediate pianists. So head over to pianopicnic.com, have a look around, buy some courses, Learn the piano, learn the keyboard, become a badass, join a band, be a rock star. Welcome to the Musicians Map podcast. My name is Kane Power. This episode is with Kurt Bellew from Converge. But first, if you want to hear more episodes like this, you need to share this episode with a friend. Go and check out the Musicians Map podcast on Facebook. There's a Facebook group, there's a website, uh, there's an ebook, there's 52 other podcast episodes just like this one. Get involved, share it around, and I'll make some more. Now, Kurt Bellew. I remember having like a little kid's record player when I was little, and you know, I learned learned how to manipulate that and scratch on it and stuff, even though I had no idea what scratching was. Really, what, what I was learning how to do was break it. I don't really remember what the songs were, but you know, like typical kid songs. I guess those would be my first musical memories. My dad was like not a particularly like great guitar player, but he was like always into music. And I remember him making me a guitar out of, um, you know, like a piece of wood with some nails on it and some rubber bands. And there's some photos around of me just like jamming on this like rubber band guitar. And I mean, it might've been like a shoe box and a stick and some rubber bands. <laughs> and so I used to do that and that was fun. Another like really important one was like the first time I ever like heard a recording. Mm. I thought that was really interesting. Like, like I had heard music, but I didn't really know anything about like how music was made or like that, that like a recording was a snapshot of a moment in time and that the recording could be manipulated and, and all that. And that for me, like that moment where I first heard music as a recording was, um, when I heard Bruce Springsteen born in the USA, cause there's this like, you know, huge reverb on the snare drum. That's just like, you know, yeah. doesn't exist in real life. And that grabbed my ear when I was, I don't know, like eight years old or something like that. It was like, whoa, what is that? Like, that is not what a drum sounds like. Something different is happening here. And I think that was one thing that started making me aware that like a recording was different than a performance sometimes. Yeah. Wow, dude. That's pretty impressive for an eight-year-old to kind of, you know, consider music that deeply. Yeah. Well, I was playing saxophone and stuff in school bands. So I was like getting into playing music by that point, maybe it was a little bit older. I don't remember, sure. but, um, but you know, around that age, you know, starting to play music in school and stuff. Yeah. So sax was your first instrument, right? Mm -hmm. When did you start that? Actually, you know what? I think I was like 10 when I started sax. So maybe the, so maybe the born in the USA thing was later. I'd, I'd have to look at like the years, but, uh, but yeah, I was like 10, I think started on alto. I ended up on baritone and I played other, you know, other wind instruments in school on the way, got into guitar when I was about 16. Were you doing lessons from a young age? Yeah, yeah. There was like lessons in school. And then um, I started taking private lessons in high school. I like briefly did private lessons on piano, I think when I was about 12, but that didn't last very long. I took private lessons up till I was done with high school. And then um, I never took any guitar lessons. Like that was all self-taught. Yeah. I didn't continue playing like saxophone seriously for very long after high school. I mean, I still pick it up once in a while, but I just... Haven't had like a group of people to play with and yep. my chops have fallen off quite a bit on that. Yeah. <laughs> Fair. What was your first guitar? Uh, I was a Kramer Strat copy. Yep. When I bought it, the nut was cracked and the low E string wouldn't stay on it. But there was like a, one of those like wide bar string retainers on the headstock that would like keep tension on the strings down. And I could wrap the low E string around the inside of one of the screws that held the string retainer down in order to like pull tension on the e-string so it wouldn't fall off the neck. Yeah. Like I could have just gotten the nut replaced, but instead I uh, I decided to just do that crappy solution. What made you switch to guitar? Because of your, of your dad? No, not really. Like, I mean, I don't know. It was just like 
as a kid, like I was more interested in rock music than I was interested in like jazz and classical. And that's what you play in school band. I mean, I was in every school band and we had like elements of rock and stuff in that, but you know, I was just, I was just interested in doing something else. And I was interested in doing something that like sounded cool playing by myself. You know, I was just kind of interested in like all things musical. And so guitar was just like another thing to try. And I wanted to start a band with friends and like, a band of like saxophones and trumpets just didn't really seem that cool at the time. So, you know, I, like my friend and I, we wanted to start a band together. We both wanted to be the bass player. So we made a little pact about whoever could save up money to buy a bass first got to be the bass player. And then the other person had to play guitar. And, <laughs> you know, he beat me to it. So I ended up playing guitar in like my group of friends. Like I think one of us saved up and bought an amp. One of us saved up and bought a bass. One of them saved up and bought a guitar. And then like, we'd all get together and like take turns playing through the amp that, you know, like there's only one amp in the whole circle of friends and we'd take turns playing through it and that kind of stuff. It was just, you know, kid stuff. Yeah. 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 I remember those days as well. Um, What are some of the bands from that period? So maybe some of the albums that you were getting into. Well, I was like super into Iron Maiden, super into Rush, And then uh, a friend of mine, actually, she and I weren't really even that close, but like just one day I was in school. I think she sat in front of me in class or something. And I don't know, just turned around and just like handed me this dubbed tape. I think it was Slayer South of Heaven. Yes. I think it was South of Heaven. I think that was the most recent record at the time. And it was like she had dubbed it from her brother and she was just like, here, I I want you to have this. I think you'll like it. I never knew why she thought that, or I never got really got any more information other than that this person that I sort of knew thought that I would like Slayer, so she gave me a Slayer tape. And that definitely changed my life. I had never heard anything like that before. And, you know, and there was like college radio around, so I was hearing like even like more extreme types of death metal on college radio, like Death, for example, and Napalm Death. Like I'd hear that stuff on the radio once in a while. And then, you know, we also had Headbangers Ball, so I would hear, like, everything from, like, hair metal to extreme metal on on that. But it was, like, very curated by the music industry. Mm. But I was also into, like, you know, I was into jazz because I was playing jazz in school. So, like, left of center music was interesting to me, and, like, goth music was interesting to me. Like, I liked The Cure, and I got really super into Sonic Youth. And, you know, like, if you break it down, like, Converge is just, like, a mix of... Slayer, Sonic Youth, and Boston Hardcore. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like the three things that I was that I was raised on. And, you know, the other really crucial component was this was like long before I had internet access, so I didn't really have much of a window to the outside world other than magazines. And being on the East Coast of the U.S. was pretty, like, well separated from what I thought youth culture was at the time. But there was Thrasher. And, you know, before that, I used to read BMX Action and BMX Plus a lot, but those were not really, like, um, as much about lifestyle as they were about like those sports themselves but thrasher was like maybe as much about lifestyle as it was about skateboarding and mike gitter and jake phelps who were from massachusetts near where i grew up like they wrote for thrasher and you know phelps ended up being the editor so there was always like a, a connection to boston hardcore in thrasher so like i you know i knew about all the like boston hardcore bands before i had ever heard them or before i ever had the opportunity to hear them sure and so like once i realized that like that stuff was there and that there was like some sort of like interesting cultural movement happening near where i was from like i became more interested in that i don't think i was really initially drawn to punk because of like what it sounded like but i was just sort of drawn to the idea that it was something new and underground that was happening near me and I should check it out. Yeah. So yeah, Boston hardcore scene. What are some of the earlier memories from shows maybe from there? You know, this would have been like 1990, 1991 ish. So like at the time the, the real big bands in Boston hardcore would have been like Slapshot, Wrecking Crew and Sam Black Church. So like second, arguably third wave of Boston hardcore that and that stuff like going to see those bands at shows was um yeah was terrifying <laughs> but also um <laughs> but also like that was like really exciting to me like i remember you know the first show that i went to was was Sam Black Church and they're a band that was like if you've never heard of them you go and try to check them out like on youtube or whatever like they were never captured properly on a recording 
there was like some okay recordings of them from later in their career, but they had like gotten way more into groove and sort of became a bit new metal adjacent. But like mm. the early Sam Black stuff was basically like Swedish death metal meets like Bad Brains. Yeah. And seeing that stuff live, the kind of energy that, that stuff had live was really insane and um, captivating to me. And the, like the first show that I ever went to was them. It was in the basement of a church and it was just a vocal PA and the vocal PA like died halfway through the show. So I think... <laughs> I don't know if he grabbed a parking cone or if he was just like putting his hands over his mouth, but um, <laughs> the singer was like, just did the rest of the show with no PA, which I thought was like completely insane, but like it didn't seem to bother him one bit and the crowd loved it even more. And I was like, yes, this is awesome. Like, I want to keep coming to these shows. Yeah. You know, prior to that, like my, like the stepping stone music for me into that would have been like, I don't know, Jane's Addiction or Metallica or something like that. And then when I saw like, the energy of that versus not that those bands don't have a ton of energy, but like the energy of seeing that in like a packed sweaty basement with like 75 other people was like entirely mm -hmm. different than like watching Jane's addiction videos on MTV. Yeah. And I wasn't, you know, certainly influenced by both of those things, but in terms of like scene and community and where my head was at, it was a lot more about like those small local shows. And, you know, and then we got like more connected with other kids our age and that were starting up bands and stuff and like dive and overcast, like overcast is probably like the best known one from that era. There was more, you know, cave in and piebald came along a little bit after us, but from the still from the same area. Mm. So let's talk about starting Converge. Like, can you talk a little bit about how you formed the band and sort of how it happened in your early years? It was kind of like a spectrum. You know, there were a bunch of friends playing music together under various band names. And when I joined the picture, the band was called Blindsided. But then we realized there was like a bazillion other bands called Blindsided. But, you know, back then you couldn't just Google a band name mm. to find out, which is why I'm shocked whenever anybody comes out with like a band name that's exactly the same as some other band name. Like, just Google your stupid band name. <laughs> like, someone's already taken it, I yeah. guarantee you. So anyway, so we did a demo. We, we realized at that point that like, there was a bunch of other bands with our names, so we should change the name. So we changed it to Undertow. And we ha even had like demos printed up with the band name Undertow. And then someone I knew was like, hey, I just saw this zine from Seattle. And there's this other band out there called Undertow. And like they had just started like months before us. You know, we're friends with them now. But um, at the time, we didn't know who they were. And uh, so we're like, ah, oh, shit, what do we do? And then it was just like, I think Jake and I just were on the phone just kind of like, flipping through books and randomly pointing at words until we <laughs> until we found something that like grabbed our attention um just because we needed a name to slap on this demo that we had recorded so that's the beginning of converge so i think the demo the demo came out in 91 but there was like the original band members like some of them had been playing together for a couple of years before that yeah under different band names where did you record it uh, a place called west sound it's a studio that we later learned was like a very Christian-oriented music studio. We didn't know at the time. Yeah. I don't believe they're still in business. I know they got more into like video production, but it was just like a local local studio. Some friends of ours had a band called Stand Against that had recorded there, and they like enjoyed recording. So, um, you know, they suggested we go there, and we did our first few recordings at that place. Yeah, it was always like recorded mix in one day. I want to say we like upped it to two days for like the last thing we did there. Nice people and, you know, easy, easy work environment. I didn't really take much of an interest in the studio at that point. It wasn't until later that I did. Yeah. So what was kind of driving the band along in those early days? Like, why were you pursuing it? You know, we weren't like ambitious as musicians, like either technically or, or business wise, maybe, um, creatively there was some ambition there but um I, I don't know i think it just wasn't a choice you know it was like we were just like weirdo kids who like needed an outlet and music provided that for us i think in general like younger people are like they act very instinctually whereas like when people get a little bit older they they have a need to like rationalize their their actions whereas like younger people would just like do what they want mm. both things are interesting and both things are good but i yeah we didn't really think too much at the time about like wow why are we doing this it was just more like we need to do this and that's why we did it and when did it start to become something that was a bit more serious like maybe we should kind of pursue this a bit harder or was it a slow transition uh, i think it, it was a slow transition I've always struggled with the whole like 
the more effort, the more time I put into something, the harder it is to let go. And the, just the more invested I became in it over the years. So I think it was a slow transition, but the the big inflection point for us was definitely like 10 years or so into the band where around you know 2001-ish, between like 99 and 2001, a lot of things happened. We had some membership changes and kind of finally solidified the lineup of the band. It became a much more collaborative working environment, whereas like prior to that, most of the songwriting was just sort of me being a tyrant. Um, and then after that was more of like a more of a group effort um, and the songs got better as a result. I got laid off in 2001 from my day job. And so that left me with more time available. I think everybody else in the band was sort of like finished with school or finishing up school and had moved. And we're, we're just sort of our personal lives. We're like more in a position to put more effort into the band. Plus just the scene that we were involved in was growing quite a bit in that time period, you know, due largely to internet message boards. There was like a, a hype about music that was happening on the internet, but it was also like before there was um, a lot of internet downloading. So like, it's not like it was profitable, but like record labels were a lot more willing to take risks on bands because, you know, there was just like more money to be made in record sales at that point in time than there than there is now. Mm. Um, so labels took a chance on us when they might not have otherwise. You know, prior to that era, we pretty much did everything ourselves or like really close friends would, would put out our stuff. And then, you know, we started getting more involved like we got involved with equal vision records and then you know later epitaph but um you know 2001 uh, is when we released jane doe and that was definitely like a big turning point in the way that people saw the band i think yeah we put out a record that was like it didn't feel like a compromise to us like it felt like more, it felt more unique than what had come before and and more reflection of of what we set out to do than what we had come up with before and maybe it, it uh, was also like sort of more unique in the field of other metallic hardcore bands at the time as well yeah yeah totally and that's kind of what, what i want to ask you about next if there was a point that it became apparent that converge was something that was a quite special and a band that was you know, considered to be important by fans, if there was a point that you noticed that or took stock and sort of thought, shit, this has become something that's quite cool. I wouldn't say there's like one exact point because, you know, people weren't not like in love with Jane Doe the instant it came out. You know, it was like a bit of a slow burn, but I think that's good. You know, like bands that have like a meteoric rise to their peak and then you know, those, those bands tend to fall off very quickly as well. And Converges have just sort of a long, slow, steady growth. And I'm even if we're in a plateau, I'm totally okay with that, at least when it comes to like commercial success. As long as we get to keep doing it, I'm really happy uh, that I get to keep making music with my friends. Yeah. And, uh, you know, for some people, if their band grows too fast, then they're just not able to keep doing that. They just have a really short, short career. And I'm, I'm happy to have like a not enormous, but long and steady one. Yeah. I mean, it's been 30 years now. Yeah, almost. It's insane. What keeps you all coming back and what keeps it fresh and interesting? It's tough to say, you know, like, I, I mean, I'm, we're us and it's hard to explain to someone else how we differ from other bands because we're not other bands. We don't know their experience and you know, what makes them tick. I know we only know what makes us tick and we're still, um, you know, passionate about the music that we make and enjoy playing together and respect each other's opinions, even when we disagree. And, you know, so we have a good working relationship and, you know, we also have like, it's enough people who are fortunately like interested in what we're doing that like, we're able to keep doing it. You know, if like, if nobody cared, it would be discouraging and maybe we still wouldn't be around, but like, yeah. there's at least a few people out there that care that affords us like the opportunities to go places and travel and meet other people and put out records and, you know, all the things that bands do. Mm. Is there like a sense of responsibility that you feel that comes with like being in Converge? There's definitely a responsibility to ourselves and to each other, you know, sort of my, my credo with, with Converge and, you know, and also with my studio is to like, try to be the thing that I would want it to be if I was on the other side. So like, you know, when it comes to like recording a band, like I want to be the engineer for that band that they would, that I would want to have recording me. And then with Converge, like I want to be the band that like I would want Converge to be if I was like a Converge fan. I think trying to 
peas fans is like a recipe for disaster, but trying to appease the fan in yourself is a recipe for success. I know it's like a very, a very fine line, but trying to predict what other people want from me is, uh, I don't, I think I would, would fail at that, but I know that like, I enjoy like sort of artistic music more than like entertainment music. So what I want to do is I want to see a band that's excited about what they're doing. I don't want to see a band that's sort of going through the motions. A band that's like so career oriented that they depend on putting out an album every 18 months so that they can continue their cycle. Converge takes like three to five years between albums because we don't only record them like when we feel like we have material that's worthy of recording and calling Converge. And, you know, to, to do that like 18 month album cycle, if you're like a career oriented band, like that's totally fine. I just don't really want that for myself. I think I would, I would get burned out. The fact that we're not really a full time band is what enables us to, um, keep going and to be creative when we, when we are together. Like it's really disheartening for me to watch a band that's just like played out. You know, they've toured too much and, and um, they're not excited about what they're doing. That's like a bum out. And like, like that's why I don't want to play songs that are 20 years old when we go on tour or 25 years old when we go on tour because I don't play them with enthusiasm. I don't have no conviction for playing like a song that's 25 years old. And I don't want to like, I don't want to get up on stage and go through the motions because somebody else likes that song. Like I'm not going to take the record away from them. They can always listen to that if they love that song. But I'm not going to, the song that I wrote when I was 25, I'm not going to emote well as like a 46 year old. Yeah. I play guitar differently and I feel differently about things and I approach my guitar playing differently now. So, yeah. I'm just, I'm trying to like come up with like rationalizations for instincts right now. Yeah. But the, <laughs> but the instinct is that we, you know, we love playing music together and we just want to keep doing it. Yeah. That's awesome. When you approach writing for Converge, you know, you've talked about approaching it from a fan's perspective so that you're writing something, you know, that people will like or that you would like. What about your rig? When you sit down and you're like, right, I'm going to, I need to write some music for Converge. Is there like a set standard, you know, Converge rig setup that you go to? You know, you've got particular amps and guitars that's, you know, just as standard and then you change from there or? It's pretty much whatever's closest, mm. you know? Yeah. It's like a lot of that stuff is driven, driven by convenience. So, you know, and my, the different rigs that I have on different tours are always like sort of based around like, oh, what songs are we playing? Like, where are we going? What backline are we going to be able to get? Like, I'm on the forever tone quest, I guess. Yeah. It's different all the time, but it's also like the fact that it's different all the time, but it also kind of sounds the same all the time. It's like the tone is my fingers and my ears more than it is, you know, the brand of amp or guitar or pedal that I'm playing. Like, I'm going to, I'm still going to like, I have a sound in my head and I'm going to dial this stuff in to cr- try to match the sound in my head. So I'm like pretty flexible about that. Yeah. I mean, I get like real crazy with it on recording, but when it comes to like writing, nah, it's really more just like whatever is like functional to get the idea across. I try not to be like too bound to technology. I also try to be not too afraid of it. You know, like I'm using Amp Sims live now, yeah. or at least for, for fly-in shows, um, and a little bit with writing as well. But, you know, I don't think I'll ever sell my amp collection either. I like, I enjoy that. I'm, I'm, I definitely have like Luddite tendencies where I want to record everything analog all the time and complain about kids these days and those sort of things. But I also, you know, like I don't want to be that person who is not accepting or, or open to new technologies because new technologies are awesome and yeah. engineering is awesome. Whether it's like coding or designing a tube amp, it's all just like creating tools for people to create with. And um, I think having great tools is, is awesome regardless of what the technology is to create them. Yeah, totally. So well, let's kind of talk a little bit about your career with that technology. When did you start experimenting with the technical side of recording? And when did you realize that you had an ear for production. Well, I mean, you maybe have said it from the, from the get-go, maybe you had an ear for it. I started taking an interest in, you know, like I said earlier, like I, a lot of the early Converge stuff I wrote by myself and then showed everybody their parts. I think it was partially like that I was a control freak and partially um, that they're just, some of the other people in the band weren't really contributing a lot of ideas. So I just sort of felt like I had to take the reins. But in order to hear all those different guitar harmonies played at the same time along with the bass part and drum part, I had to like figure out a way to make demos. And, you know, for me, it was like borrowing a friend's four track because I couldn't afford my own. And then I got a drum machine though. So like dr- drum machine, four track and guitar and start making demos that way. And, I, you know, we recorded some 
four track demos early on, which I did. I could never afford a four track though, but by the time I could afford a four track, I had enough money for an eight track. So I bought this like little Tascam half inch eight track and a small mixing console and started doing little better demos in my parents' basement, then started recording friends bands for free, then started recording friends bands for 10 bucks an hour. And then like started recording friends or friends bands for 15 bucks an hour. And, and then that just sort of snowballed. And the whole time I was like, you know, working day jobs and putting whatever money I made in that into studio equipment. And, you know, I didn't think it was going to be like a career for me, but people kept asking me to record them. So sort of like the way that the band snowballed, my recording career snowballed like that. I just, as opportunities came along, I pursued them. I didn't really seek them out, but um, there, there weren't a lot of other people doing recording at the time. Hmm. In the Northeast, you know, where I was from, there was, you know, I don't know, a handful, like, you know, probably less than a half a dozen people that were involved in like punk music that were doing recording or like, you know, sort of DIY recording. There just weren't a lot of people. So if you had a studio, you, you were going to get work, um, especially if you were like somewhat of an insider to like a particular music scene, you were going to get work in that scene. And so people just started coming to me for that. And I guess I got better and, you know, put money in the studio and the studio got better. And then I got laid off and I had to make a choice between like either like doubling down on the studio or trying to find another job within, you know, my chosen career path. Um, and I just ended up doubling down on the studio and, and haven't looked back. That's awesome. How long has it been at God City now? Um, well, the name God City started in 1995, like the very first studio that I had, like on that with that 8-track in my parents' basement, I called that God City. Yeah. And uh, the name's been around. So I'm, I'm the studio I have in Salem, Massachusetts now has been there since 2003, but that's actually the fourth location. Sure. That's awesome. Um, okay, man. Well, I've got a little quiz to run through. Okay. Um, if you're game. Let's do it. Who's your favorite uh, artist, if there was one? I don't know. Is this quiz all favorite for this, top 10, that? Because I'm terrible at all those kind of questions. I don't have, like, I literally don't have a favorite anything. Okay. Maybe we could do like... <laughs> There's a couple, a couple of, it's, it doesn't have to be the, the absolute, you know, God, pinnacle. I don't, I don't have a pinnacle either. So I like Elvis Costello a lot. He's cool. Let's just go with that. Yeah. He's one. Elvis Costello. Elvis Costello. This year's model is definitely like one of my top 10 favorite albums. I can say that for sure. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. If you were to put on, on a record right now, like someone that you're listening to at the moment, what's the first record you'd go to today? Shit. I guess Elvis Costello. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, just before you called, we were we were listening to the Hollow Notes. There it is, classic, cool. Top three albums as a fan: In South of Evan, Slayer, Sonic Youth, Goo, and um, Fugazi, and on the Kill Taker. Yes. Uh, what about the top three sounding albums? Albums that you really, you know, even if they're not your favorite albums musically, if that you really admire from a production standpoint. Hmm. Tom Waits Blood Money Bark Market has an album called Elron. That's really incredible sounding. Entombed Wolverine Blues is pretty untouchable too. So let's say that. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. I'm so terrible about these questions because <laughs> I'm like being a recording engineer has made me kind of like not a music fan. Yeah. Because I can't listen, I can't listen to music without analyzing it. Yeah. So I don't, I don't really listen to a lot of music. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Other than like the stuff that I'm working on. Yeah. Me too. Um, best live show. What's, is there a show that stands out in your memory as the best you've seen? I mean, that first Sam Black Church show that I was talking about earlier yeah. definitely is up there. I mean, seeing Fugazi is up there. Boris is pretty amazing just from like a sonic perspective. The makeup. I've seen the makeup a bunch of times. That's a band. Like when you see a band who can like control an audience, it's really impressive. And that was like a band that could really control an audience as well as any other band I've ever seen. Yeah. Awesome. What about the best live show that you've played? That's tough. We've played so many shows. It's tough to say. Yeah. But um, the last time we played Hellfest was pretty amazing. Like, we really like felt like stars. Yeah, <laughs> you know? I mean, Hellfest in the, is has become like a pretty special festival, 
And uh, this the last appearance there was like one of the biggest shows he'd ever played, and really like something about the um, like just the massive amount of people there watching us that really like I think propelled us to play better than usual. A lot of times, like a lot of times, like big festivals, like you know, we just play terrible at, or a lot of times, two big festivals are like the f- a one off show or like the first show on a tour. So we're not really like warmed up, but on this particular run, Hellfest happened at like the exact right time on the tour for us to be like in really good shape. Still really excited to be playing. And um, it was just a great show. Some of the other most memorable ones would be like, there's this place uh, we used to play in Montreal all the time called Sal de Lex. It's just basically like L apostrophe X. Um, And that place was like, it was really small and it was, kind of in a basement but um it was like a two-story sort of situation where like there was a balcony that went like all around the stage so like you had people in front of you but you also had people on a very low balcony beside and behind you so you could just kind of felt like you were completely surrounded by people and we played there a bunch but the shows were always like pretty amazing yeah and i'd say was one one more would be like our first show ever in tokyo like we never in a million years thought that we would get a chance to play in Japan when we did for the first time, you know, it's like a 12 hour time difference. Right. So we're all like dead tired and you know, we're just like trying to get like hyped up to go play the show. And we asked our friend who was with us, if he could go like find some energy drinks and cause we, none of us were like big energy drink people, but like we knew we needed something to like wake us up. So we drank these things that had like what sort of looked like the Red Bull logo on them. And it just had the letter D. And it was this <laughs> tiny little like medicine bottle, like vial thing. And there's the video of the show that's on um, that last Blu-ray that we put out where we're like, we're completely insane. Like Nate's not even playing his bass. He's just like holding the strap and like whipping the bass around his <laughs> head, like not even playing it. And like we found out uh, after the show that they were nicotine drinks. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> yes. So that show was pretty, it was pretty nuts too. And uh, But I don't know, there's been so many great ones over the years. And it's been just been like nice to get a chance to go around and play all kinds of different places and that people are welcoming to us in all parts of the world. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, what about if there's a story that kind of stands out as the worst gig experience, it could be anything like funny or upsetting or sad. Things really come to mind as worst gig. I mean, we've had all sorts of various stage injuries, like I'm missing a tooth because I got hit in the face with a guitar and like, you know, all of us have like had major stage vomit. Oh. incidents I've you know like I hit Jake in the face with a guitar once that gave him stitches mm. Oof. we we haven't really had a lot of like musical train wrecks you know none of us like really like party or anything like that so it's not like there's any kind of situations with bad performances based on that I don't really have like a specific like worst gig okay yeah that's cool the other guys might have might have something to say about that but like, yeah I just I can't think of anything that was like really bad yeah fair enough Kurt thank you so much dude I really really appreciate you coming on the podcast not a problem thanks for having me and there it is Kurt Bellow what an absolute legend you can find Kurt on Instagram at God City Music and Facebook at Kurt Bellow you can find Converge at convergecult.com Instagram and Facebook at Converge. Kurt's studio, God City, is at godcitystudio.com and his instrument website is godcityinstruments.com. Kurt's choice for artist of the episode is Mundy's Bay. You can check them out at mundysbaymusic.com, Instagram at mundysbaymusic and Facebook, Mundy's Bay. All of the links you'll find in the show notes for this episode. So thank you for listening. If you like this episode, please share it with a friend. Hopefully we'll have some more episodes coming to you soon.